Welcome to our second session of the Book of Romans, and we're beginning our study in Chapter 1. Hopefully, in this sec section, or this session, I'm hoping to get through the first 17 verses of Romans Chapter 1, and begin in the next session, verse 18. Of course, you know what they say about best laid plants, sometimes they, they seem to go awry. In my case, every time they seem to go right. Anyway, we're going to start out in uh, chapter 1 of Romans in this, in this session in verse 1. Before we do, though, I have a couple of corrections I need to make, or at least comments I need to make. In the last session, I talked about the Emperor, uh, Emperor Claudius of the Roman Empire. And if you recall, Claudius is the one, according to Acts chapter 18, that forced the Jews out of the city of Rome. And so we read about a couple of very important Jews who were, who were Christians, who were very good workers, very instrumental in spreading the gospel and teaching it. We read about, in Acts chapter 18 and verse 1, we read about Aquila and Prisca, who evidently husband and wife. We also know them as Aquila and Priscilla. And they meet Paul there in Corinth. And as, as such, they begin to study together. They, they use, probably use the same residence and they, they reside together because as it turns out, they're, both, they're all three tent makers. And so in Corinth, that becomes a very profitable occupation, at least an occupation that puts food on the table. Now, that was in Corinth. He meets up with them, he works with them. They, I'm sure they get very close. Then we read in in Romans chapter 16 that when Paul sends greetings to the to the members there in Rome via his epistle he asked them to give greetings to Aquila and, Pris and Prisca which means they have left left uh, Corinth and they have returned to Rome and that's when Paul writes a letter to him because that's when he, when he uh, sends greetings to them. Now Emperor Claudius died in 54 AD. Last In the last se session I wrote 54 BC and then I proceeded, paramecium brain as I am, to refer to it and I kept saying 54 BC. That was wrong. Claudius, that particular emperor, died in 54 AD so by the time Aquila and Prisca returned to Rome and had to be after this date and so that's why we put the, the writing of the Book of Romans somewhere between 55 and 58 AD. Most likely it's closer to the 58. But I wanted to make sure I corrected that because for some reason, unbeknownst to me, uh, when I looked at a little blurb of it last from the last session, I saw that I put BC, which was, okay, it was stupid. I shouldn't have done it that way. But uh, I meant to write AD, and for some reason it came out BC. So just to make that correction. now. The other statement that I wanted to make with regards to our last session is we talked about Paul calling himself in the terms he used call in the New American Standard, calling himself a bond servant. And how we talked about in our in in our particular society, the word slave has many negative con connotations. So the translators tend to use this term. What Paul wrote was slave. He wrote the word doulos, which is the Greek term for slave. Paul knew someone else owned him. And that's the way he wanted. Now what the remarkable thing is, that to, to me it's very encouraging, is Paul, Paul, as Saul, was born a Roman citizen. And in Roman society, that held a, a considerable amount of prestige. And so Paul, or who at first was Saul, was a Roman citizen, and within that society, that elevated his status considerably. And he used that a few times, depending on the, on the situation. But when he wrote to the church in Rome, he didn't say Roman citizen. He said slave, and to me that's, a, that's an admirable attitude. He didn't, in his mind, this is what was important. This is the true life. 
not status in a particular society, but being a slave to Christ, being owned by him. Paul was, was, was proud of that. Okay, now, looking at the uh, first paragraph or so of Romans chapter 1, we read, Paul, a bondservant of Christ, Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. It's uh, interesting that Paul calls himself an apostle because that was a special term and it should carry special meaning with the church there in Rome. When he calls himself a, an apostle, the Greek term for that is apostolos. And the definition basically is one who is sent. Now, apostolos is not a Greek word that is unique to the Kone dialect, nor is it that it originate with the Kone dialect. Greek is an old language. It has many dialects. The one that the society is most familiar with is the dialect that Homer wrote in when he wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. That's considered the Homeric dialect of Greek. Or later ages, uh, and, and, and many scholars today refer to this as the epic dialect because Homer wrote epic poems in this particular dialect, so they talk about it being the epic dialect. Now, in New Testament times, of course, we understand that the New Testament was written in the Kone dialect, or which is a Greek term for common. What happened was, this is the Greek of Homer's day, and it was supplanted by Kone, because Alexander and his army, as they travel around the Mediterranean area, conquering different lands, this is the dialect his soldiers spoke. And so this becomes, as we might say, the international language. The word apostolos is an old Greek term. It didn't start with Kone, it probably started even before Homer, uh, Homer's days, but it means one who is sent. And that's led to con some confusion amongst people, because if we look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2, um, excuse me, verse 25, but I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. That word medicine, uh, messenger is the Greek word apostolos. It simply means one sent. We also find the same term in uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 23. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brethren, they are messengers of the churches a glory to Christ. Now what has happened over the years for in some circles is because Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus was referred to as a messenger and the Greek word apostolos was used to communicate that. Others have said well Epaphroditus might have been must have been an apostle then. Well that's that's not true. The uh, like I said apostolos is an old Greek term that that went from from a Homer's dialect or the epic dialect to Kone, and it simply means one sent. That is, Epaphroditus was sent. He wasn't an apostle as Paul was. He was simply sent. In the New Testament, we find that this particular term, apostolos, we find that 79 times. Paul used apostolos there in Romans chapter 1. But if we read a little bit further in that particular paragraph, uh, Paul, a bondservant of Christ, Jesus called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son who was born of the descendant of David according to the flesh. Uh, goes on in verse 5, through whom we have received grace and, a, and as he says, apostleship. Apostleship. Now, in the Greek, the Greek term that's translated apostleship is apos, apostolo. Apostolo or apostole. This word only occurs four times in the New Testament, and every time we find this term, 
we find it referring to Paul or the original 12 apostles that we find in Acts chapter 1. So the apostleship is designated differently from this term ap apostolos, which is uh, apostole, and it only occurs four, and like I said, it's only in reference to the 12 apostles. If we looked at, for example, if we look at Acts chapter 1, where Paul, where Peter stands up and talks to them about uh, uh, about Judas, verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate and let no one dwell in it and let another man take his office, talking of course about Judas. Verse 24, and they prayed and said, you Lord who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship apostole and it's only used this term is only used in reference to Paul or these original 12 ap apostles in in Acts chapter uh, in Acts chapter 1 so Paul when he says a an apostle it's an apostle in this sense of the word that he he is an office holder speaking of himself as one who is born out of, as he says, due season, but nevertheless one who is an apostle and occupies that particular office, uh, whereas others are just ones who are sent, envoys we might say, or something like that. So, moving on there in, uh, in Romans chapter 1, let me finish reading Get in verse 4, excuse me, let me read first uh, begin continue reading those seven verses verse 4 who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among who all among all the Gentiles for his name's sake among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ verse 7 to all who are beloved in God in Rome called as saints grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ that seven verses it is in the New American Standard one sentence and I know what you're thinking uh oh I'll never figure this one out a sentence seven verses long. How in the world can we figure out what Paul is trying to tell us? Well, yes, it's one sentence, but you have to think of it, break it down a little bit. It is one sentence, and it is, in a sense, a chain of phrases, or um, a chain of independent or dependent clauses. Uh, and this is what the this is what the sentence is comprised of. Now, he adds clauses, and those extra clauses that he adds in this percent in this particular sentence they add definition to what he's talking about the statements that he has made initially they the the clauses that follow add definition or they add clarification uh, or they add emphasis so if we take a step back when we run into one of Paul's long sentences and we remember what he's doing in those sentences, it's a little bit easier to figure it out. That he makes a long sentence, but his first statement begins a chain of thoughts where he, as I said, he adds definition to those thoughts, he adds clarification to those thoughts, he adds emphasis. What's important brings out truly what is important in the, that, those particular sentences. So. The New American Standard Version, the English Standard Version, they all have those seven verses in one sentence. The New King James Version, it divides it up into just two sentences. Uh, the New International Version has about four sentences. And we read those and we think, <laughs> I'll never be able to understand that. That long sentence of Paul that has all these different thoughts. Well, understand what those thoughts do. And we break it down a little bit in our minds and we begin to understand then what his message is. Now those seven verses comprise what we might say is a salutation. You'll, if you read commentators they'll use this term and they'll say the seven first seven verses in this case one through seven are a salutation. That's where Paul says tells them who 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 is writing 
which is himself, that he's writing to the church there in Corinth, and who the audience is, or who the letter is addressed to. In this case, we might put who the addressee is, and in this case, it's the church of Rome. This is a standard practice in Paul's day. This is how letters were written. The reason they were, were written was because the, the book to the Romans would have been carried around on it as a scroll and as lo and considering how long that book is that scroll probably would have been about 20 feet long so if you had to get to the end of the letter to find out who wrote it someone said well who write this letter who wrote this letter someone else gonna say well give me about an hour and I'll let you know because that's how long it would take quite a while to get to the end of the letter so right up front he tells who's writing it he tells who it's addressed to, and we re often refer to that as the uh, salutation. Moving on, we talked about uh, that that first those first seven verses, and uh, how Paul tells them who's writing it and who it's to. There is um, a statement made in those first first seven verses actually it's in verse 3 if you look at verse 3 he says uh, concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh he uses the term descendant of David when he talks about Jesus and that's kind of that could be a little bit confusing because you think, wait a minute, the church in Rome was was Rome is a Gentile community, so the church there was probably composed of Gentiles. Yes, it was, but this is kind of a clue. This is a hint to tell us something, because if you write to Jews and Gentiles, you actually have to write, in essence, as it were two letters because with respect to the Jew that's a different audience than in the, in the case of the Gentile. The important point, the important point that they had to get was with respect to Jesus he rose from the dead and because he rose from the dead he gives us opportunity for salvation he becomes our sacrifice we need him to um, have our sins forgiven it that is critical because it proves to us that Jesus was a sacrifice through whom our sins can be forgiven now with respect to the Jew yes they need this is very important information to them but what they need to know is about this person this man oh yeah well God has raised other people from 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 the dead but what is it about this because we know that the person that's important to us is the Messiah. Not only is he risen from the dead, but he has to be a particular descendant. He has to be descended initially through Abraham, through Isaac, through uh, Jacob. But what is truly important in their minds is he had to be a descendant of David. With respect to the Gentile, they need to know that Jesus rose from the dead but they need to know that he was the son of the one God. In Acts chapter 17, when Paul is uh, talking to the Areopagites, and he's talking about all these idols that he saw in the city of, of Athens as he traveled through it, uh, he says in verse 23, For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to, the, uh, to an unknown God. They had idols to all kinds of imagined gods. They were polytheistic. They didn't want to leave one out. They even had an idol to an unknown god. We went to Corinth, and there the temple to Apollos, and then up on the high hill by Corinth, you could see the ruins of the temple to Diana. They had a temple to everybody they were polytheistic what they needed to know what they needed to know was Jesus rose from the dead from the one true God there's only one God and that God is going to hold us accountable he has given everything he can to save us and he's trying to change us into the person that can appreciate him and appreciate the promise that he holds forth from us
Uh, verse 24, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life, breath, and all things, ultimately his son who died. So, if you're going to write a letter to the to uh, a, a Jewish audience, you're going to write it from a certain point of view or perspective, shall we say, because they believe that there's only one God, only one Jehovah. They knew that. That, that was, that was a, a fact that they were raised with all their entire life. The Gentiles didn't know that. So you have to address these two groups of people differently because of, of where, their, uh, where their perspective tends to be located. And we'll find, so that's why I think in that third verse, he talked about Jesus as being a descendant of David because there was probably a large segment of, of Jews in that particular church there in, in Rome. Obviously, Aquila and Priscilla are evidence of that, but there probably was a lot of Jews. So in his letter, we remember, please remember as we go through Romans, in his letter, he's going to be talking to two groups of people. And those two groups are looking at what he's saying from two different perspectives. They got different eyes on the, on the subject, and so they have to, they will be seeing it differently. So Paul has to anticipate that, and one of the ways he anticipated is in verse 3, he talked about Jesus as being a descendant of David. I think a very important clue or, or bit of information. Now, um, Paul uh, goes on in verse 8, to talk to them about something that is very important to him. He had never been to Rome thus far. Now, maybe he knew he was going to end up there. Maybe somehow the Spirit had revealed to him that he would be arrested and someday he was going to end up in the, uh, defending himself, even in the court of Caesar. Maybe Paul already knew this. We don't know. But Paul had not been to Rome and to the church there in Rome before, uh, uh, before he wrote this letter. And so they're seeing a letter from a person they've never met. But they know Paul to be, as he says, an apostle, and also as he talks about being a slave from Christ. Moving on in verse 8. <clears throat> Catch my breath just a little bit. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for, for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the world. That's quite, a, that's quite a compliment to the church in Rome. Their faith is being proclaimed everywhere. He's gone places and they know about the church in Rome. And they speak well about the church in Rome. And he hears this as he travels around. It's not unlike a Rosedale been to the Philippines uh, with Randy and we found, and I have found that that the name Rosedale is spoken of in a very favorable manner we we are we are known uh, by members in other places in other parts of the world and because of that it's our 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 faith has been proclaimed you might say but there's another side of the coin in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the world. He is putting obligation on their shoulders. He says, people know that you're a faithful church. And so what do they think? Ooh, we got to stay faithful. We got to continue to be a good example. So you know, he compliments them, but at the same time, you know, he lays a little weight on their shoulders and saying, you know, people know you to be a faithful church. A faithful group of people worshiping God. It's not unlike what we have in this day and age. Rosedale is well spoken of in other parts of the world, but understand this puts obligation on us. We have to remain faithful. We have to live up to what they're what what they understand and what they know about us. So we've got to be as uh, in as the case of Rome. We've got to be rather careful of what we do. Moving on, verse 9. For God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, 
He says, making request, it perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. So he has always prayed for the church there, prayed that they may, may be made strong, and also he has prayed that he might be able to visit them. He considers that a, uh, uh, a plan that he's making. He wants to go visit them. Uh, he wants to be able to, to spend time with them. I, I don't know in his mind what that, how long he's talking about or such, but he wants to be able to go to Rome someday. And like I said, he may have, um, he may have uh, already know, known that he would have been there, but he wanted to be there with the, uh, with the church. He says that he remembers them always in my prayers. Now, verse 11. Uh, I didn't realize the impact of these couple of verses until recently, but I got to thinking about this. Verse 11, for he says, For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. So he wants him to be stronger. And as an apostle, as he said, he is able to bequeath them uh, measures of the Holy Spirit in a miraculous sense. He is an apostle. He is able to do that. When the apostles died, of course, that, um, that ability to pass on those gifts died with them. But Paul knows that he can, he can give them or bequeath to them some spiritual gift to help them to be stronger. Remember, they don't have the New Testament now. Uh, they uh, don't have, um, probably don't have most of the New Testament already written down. They have got might have a little bit of it available, but, but most of the knowledge is going to have to come through these spiritual gifts that, that Paul can bestow upon them. So he's, he's anxious to get there, to spend time with them, and also to help them to become stronger, as he says. But look what else he says. In verse 12, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. That's a very sobering thought. Because what Paul is saying is, I want to be with you so that I can be made stronger. And we're thinking, Paul, you're an apostle. God is speaking his words through you. You've been, you've, you've seen it all. You've done it all. You got the t-shirts to prove it. And he had traveled around. He had been persecuted on several occasions, almost killed, almost drowned. He had, he had done it all. He was an apostle. He had, as he says in Ephesians chapter 3, he had the mind of Christ. He had the, the ultimate faith. He had gone through all of those and he had remained he had remained a faithful Christian. In the first verse, what did he say? He was, he was proud of being a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we're going to teach him something? That's what he said. In verse 12, that is that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. He would be made, he looked forward to, to being with the church in Rome so that he might be made stronger. And in this day and age, some may wonder, well, why, why should I bother to, to assemble and to worship together? What benefit is there to me? Paul saw benefit to himself. And who, who can match compare the faith that Paul had. And yet he saw the benefit of it. So that's telling us that certainly we need to worship together, we need to be together, we need to assemble together, we need to study together. If it helped Paul, it certainly will help each, and, each of us. We may not feel that way, but Paul is telling us we will be that way. That's why it's so important as a congregation, we are a together body of people. Because we each need to be made stronger by one another's presence. He says, the other says, both yours and mine. 
And on that note, verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. He wanted to help. He wanted to help them to be stronger. He hasn't been able to be there yet. And he's, he doesn't see in the very near foreseeable future the opportunity to go. But he wants to be there and he wants to help. He wants them to be stronger and he does through, through prayer. Now, the book of Romans is an epistle written by Paul, or a letter written by Paul to the church at Rome. It's 16 chapters long. It's a long epistle. It's a long letter. Like I said, if it was written in the form of a scroll, that scroll would be about 20 feet long. It's a, it's a big letter. How would you reduce the book of Romans into a single sentence? 16 chapters, some of them very long chapters, and we want to somehow reduce the book of Romans into a single sentence to help us to remember what it's about. How would you do that? Can you do that? Yes, you can. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's the book of Romans. The power of the gospel, the power of God, as he says, to all who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's what we're going to see. How that epistle has plays a part in the gospel being preached to Jews and to Greeks to be saved by God. That's that's the book. That's the book in a single sentence nutshell. No, nutshell. He goes on to say in verse 17, For in it, in the New Testament and in the Gospel, he says, is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith. That is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. It's been a progression, starting with the creation, with Adam and Eve in the garden. God gave them knowledge of his righteousness. True is only a little bit but he revealed to them his righteousness. And then as it progressed through the patriarchal age, God revealed his right righteousness in amounts, in limited amounts, to the patriarchs. He revealed it to Abraham. Abraham began to see what the righteousness of God truly is. Abraham began to understand how he, as a man, was not righteous. But he could see the righteousness, beginning to see the righteousness of God, Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, on down through the patriarchs, they see more and more the righteousness of God. So the, the patriarchs, they had a righteousness that they could obey. It talk, that's what um, it says of, of Abraham, that he was righteous because of what he believed and that he was true to his faith. When God said, I want you to sacrifice your son, he did it. Fortunately, God provided him the sacrifice before he lost his son. But Abraham was judged righteous. He could now see the righteousness of God. The law of Moses comes, comes along through, through Moses in about 1400 BC. Moses writes for the Jews what, what is called the law of Moses. God begins to reveal more and more of his righteousness. So there's a righteousness in the patriarchal age that God revealed. Then there's a righteousness, a continued amount of righteousness revealed in the law of Moses, the Mosaical age that God be bequeaths on the Jews. So we begin to see more and understand more and more of who God is. Ultimately, ultimately we have God's righteousness fully revealed to us through his son. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also he made the world. So God provided and revealed his righteousness from faith 
to faith, to faith. From dispensation to dispensation to dispensation. And now we are truly blessed in that we have all the righteousness that God wants us to know in the New Testament, the the culmination of such the gospel that was delivered through his son. A a truly uh, sobering thought and also one to uh, uh, truly appreciate. James in chapter 1 verse 25, he talks about this being the perfect law of liberty. It has all we need. It has all we need to know. It has all we need to know about God so that we can be holy as he is holy, as as Peter has said. So on that note, we'll uh, drive a peg there and on the next session, we'll pick it up in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1. Thanks for your attention.